This is a WeAreIowa.com original documentary, The Floods of 2018, Lessons Learned. Hold on to the fence. I'm so glad we were not in there. <laughs> How did I get out of there? We were underwater, completely dazed, so dark, all the lights were out um, in the basement. When I was underwater, I was like, I'm, I'm gonna die. Do I fight do, or do I try? We heard a whistle and the entire place blew up. The city won't do what they need to do. My husband almost drowned in that backyard. This particular street, they knew about the, the collapsed storm drain five years ago. Are we a priority, sir? Are we a priority? I feel like the city's to blame for not telling us any of this. I feel like FEMA should be kicking in so we can save our lives and save our houses. We have nothing now. This neighborhood is destroyed. <laughs> Every time we carry out an item, you know those people would love to keep it, and, but we know that it, it long term is not going to happen. Water was rushing with such force and such great um, sound. I know Four Mile Creek is right on the back side of our complex, but uh, I never imagined anything like this happening. I mean, I know we've had a lot of rain, but this is just ridiculous. <laughs> There's no taking time to pick and choose. It's just get it, throw it in and get it out of here. Like we had a waterfall coming out of our door. This has never happened before and this is like, it's just a freak out moment. Two o'clock in the morning, when me and him went to bed, it was not like this. Like it was like that fast. The kids grew up in this house. I mean, this is the only house they've ever, ever known. We take the blame and we'll take the issues that everybody gave us and we're going to move forward and change that and make this place a lot better than when, when we just went through on Saturday. Nature's fury drowned the metro June 30th into the early morning hours of July 1st, 2018. The damage ripped apart homes and livelihoods, crippled businesses, and took the life of a well-known sports analyst and personality, Larry Kotler. It's now one year later. I'm Stephanie Engelson and I'm standing along the bed of Four Mile Creek, the main culprit for devastation in cities across the metro like Urbandale, Pleasant Hill, Des Moines and Ankeny. It may not look like much now, but even a tame creek can turn into a monster when eight to ten inches of rain fall in just a matter of hours. In every devastating event like the deadly floods of 2018, we strive to learn from it. What could have been prevented? What could we have done differently? What could we change? The family that lost the most that night didn't lose property. They lost a father and a husband, and our city lost a local sports broadcasting legend. For the first time since June 30th, Deb Kotler, the widow of Larry Kotler, tells WeAreIowa.com's Lou Seipolt how a stranger saved her as she watched the love of her life swept away by floodwaters. You know, as a guy who's a, a part-time umpire, mm -hmm. that'd be a hard call to make. It's, it's been hard, Lou. Um, there have not only been uh, physical scars, uh, but then there are the emotional scars that I still fight with today. And we all know what happened when Larry was taken from us, but a lot of people might not realize that you came very close to being taken from us as well. We were trying to come home from the menace game. I was supposed to sing the national anthem. But the weather, as we all know, turned just horrible. And I looked up at the sky, and it was right before it started to rain. And I told Larry, I said, we should try and, and get home. And we made it to Merle Hay Mall. We picked up a few items, and then every, every street was blocked. He said, well, I think we can make it. And as soon as we made that turn, the water caught the car. Uh, little did we know it ended up sweeping the car over a curb. Otherwise, we probably would have been, you know, fine. But he was on the phone to 911. I was on the phone. Zachary had called because our basement had started flooding right. that night. And um, he had told the operator that the car was beginning to flood and she told us to get out. Uh, there was a young couple uh, that had come over to my side of the window and I told them that we were just, as soon as he hung up, we were getting out of the car. We exited on his side. We were able to make it across the street to the parking 
and then the force of the water took me down first and then him and it then eventually just I couldn't keep my grip onto him and I was swept over first uh, he called my name three times and that was the last thing I heard. I made the assumption that he was somehow able to fight the force of the water because I never heard him, I never saw him. I think the only thing that saved my life was I was swept over to the left into a grove of trees and hung on to uh, a limb there. Uh, a couple of limbs. I tried to wrap myself around the tree. The water took me under a couple of times and then swept me down a little further. And then I could see a light, so I always called this young man my angel that God sent. He was across the ravine, but had made his way over to, to my side, which was the west side. Um, and there were, uh, the other neighbor on that side had thrown down a garden hose and the young man had said to me, trust me, you need to let go. I promise I will catch you, to which he did. And then by that time, I just, I had no energy. Um, but he said, you know, you've got to try, the water's coming. And so with his help, I was able to scamper up the hill and to safety. So I just always call him my angel and the neighborhood, the, the neighbors came and brought me blankets and kept me as warm as they could. Um, our neighbor, who Zachary had gone to when the basement was flooding, came and got me and uh, took me back home because I was just, you know, covered. And um, he said, you need to come home and take a shower. And so I did. And then by the time I got back, which was, I think, a little after 1 o'clock in the morning, somewhere around there, uh, that was when he found his body. Wow. And then I later found out, I was able, I've been able uh, to talk with the fire department and the firefighters, and they told me that when they found Larry, they treated him with much dignity and respect, which is all that I could ask for. How long were you married? Six years. Six years. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing time together because you were a, a couple that was perfect we, with each other. You know, one of my friends uh, had said to me, you waited a long time for that special person. And he was. He took the last piece of my heart and I gave it to him wholly. And this that I wear all the time is one of the last gifts that he gave me for Mother's Day which says, always in my heart. And so I wear it every day because that's what he was. And he'll be forever in and all of our hearts. And he will be forever in my heart. How would you like people to continue to remember him? We're never going to forget the cop, man. There's no way. But how would you like people to continue to remember Larry? You know, he gave to the community. He loved this community. Even though he grew up in St. Louis, Des Moines really became his home. Um, and especially when we talk about Drake and how much he wanted people to recognize Drake as their home team and how much he loved the Barnstormers. And it, he never said no. The, anyone who approached him, even when um, we were joking about the fact that the Jewish guy was calling baseball for my alma mater at Dowling. You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> you know, how many people would expect that? But that was the kind of man he was. Like that, no, I mean, we we're always excited because it's a brand new start. Everybody's excited because, hey, nobody has won or lost a game yet, mm -hmm. and, there, and there's always optimism. Now, the room where Drake Athletics holds its press conferences has been renamed the Larry Kotler Media Room. Larry was honored a week exactly after his death at the Barnstormers Championship game, and Deb thinks that Larry certainly played a part in that Barnstormers victory. Now, the area where the Kotlers were swept away is pretty close to where I'm standing here in Beaverdale. This was one of the areas that was really hard hit in that flooding, and residents here are still wondering what's being done to not only improve conditions so it doesn't flood as much, but what's being done to improve response. 
It was one of the most searing moments in the days after the flooding. Ward 1 City Councilman Bill Gray, touring the flood damage, came face to face with the people who had their lives turned upside down. Are we a priority, sir? Are we a priority? A year later, on a much different type of day in Beaverdale, and touring some of those promised changes, Councilman Gray says he will never forget the anguish he saw. But then you saw the, the uh, amount of devastation that took place in all the other areas of the city. Uh, it, you know, I just, it, it tears your heart out. You know, you see people's prized possessions, prized belongings. Um, people were throwing away old time photo albums because they were ruined. A lot of history and a lot of memorabilia gone. That heated encounter came from frustration over cleanup, and Gray says the city's response was inadequate. It's one of the greatest lessons he took from that day. When I drove around and saw, uh, our first response was, well, put a tag on it and stick it on the curb. And then we said, well, we'll have uh, dumping sites that were poorly staffed. Uh, we knew then that, that we'd better go to uh, the plan that we over deliver and make the people happy. We finally realized that we have to let them put it out in the curb. We don't want people getting sick, stuck with all that stuff, throwing wet stuff in their car to go to a dump site. Didn't make any sense. Gray is confident they're better prepared to handle the after effects of another catastrophic flood. But the big nagging question that remained, can the city do anything to keep water from building up and overwhelming the system, taking entire homes with it? The answer is yes, but with a lot of work. To show you a construction project that is underway right now, we bring you to 41st and College in Beaverdale. This is a low-lying area with the closest creek bed just beyond those trees right there. Now imagine about 10 inches of rain falling in just a few hours and then flowing from all these different directions to this point. That creek bed overflowed, the water raced through the house that used to be on this lot and then crossed 41st Street to Germania. From there, it was all downhill. That flood water then all raged down Germania Drive, like we're showing you here, and it ended up at the storm drain at the mouth of Makokoda Drive. Imagine all that water converging here and draining into this. There simply was nowhere for it all to go. So let's go back to that now empty lot on 41st and College Avenue. If you drive by, it may not look like much, but a lot is happening. Engineers uh, have already purchased this house. They're looking at two others in the back, and if we can do that, we're going to build a, a water retention basin back there, and what that will do is it'll hold the water back so that the normal clearance of the water coming through here can get through and then be released as, as a, a trickle after all the heavy water's been gone by. Crews will also bore under 41st to build a larger sewer line and make the Makokota drain bigger, pushing the water to a ravine where it can then pass through safely. It's one of many weak spots the city wanted to correct right away, but with widespread devastation, money can be a barrier to progress. You know, we, we took a look at uh, we, where can we get some money. One cent sales tax was obviously big uh, to go that way, and then increasing the stormwater management fees. If we can get those things doing, we can take projects that were like five years out compress them into three and two years and start to address the issues that these people are seeing firsthand. And I think when, when you know, we did the right thing when we put it on the ballot that we're not going to take this and just put this money into a slush fund that we're going to take from whenever we want to. Uh, if we would have said that, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, so we identified the areas, you know, the first 50 percent was going to go to property tax relief. Then we said infrastructure and roads. And infrastructure meant sewers. That caught people's attention a lot. And I think it turned around. So if they can see an immediate benefit being done by increasing my sales tax by a penny, it's well worth it. Voters in Des Moines overwhelmingly passed the penny tax increase. No and Gray to says to when he walks around Beaverdale today, he gets a more positive response. Neighbors are involved in the recovery process and seeing construction like this with their own eyes. When people see that we're going forward, we're getting the job done, that, that makes people feel a little bit better. They know that I, my vase was going to be dry. You know, you can take a little bit of uh, turmoil and turn it into something if you react, if you react in the right way. And I think that's what we did. Now, Bill Gray says there are certainly other areas that need to be addressed, and one of them is right here. We're at 47th and Holcomb, which is in Beaverdale, and it's a really unassuming looking neighborhood, right? Looks like a lot of streets. But this is a 31 acre plot of land that is built in a basin shape. So think of it as 31 acres of a sink that all drain right here at this intersection. This floods a lot. And last year, during the flooding, 
Dozens of homes had water filling their basements. So one of the biggest projects to come out of the floods of 2018 will be right here along these streets to the tune of about five million dollars and did a substantial amount of damage. Des Moines Public Works Director Jonathan Gano took us to four of the high priority sites in the city. This, he says, is the big one, and it has been on the to-do list for a while. What's traditionally been happening for the last two decades is this intersection will fill up, and as soon as you get a foot or two of water in the intersection, it starts making its way into people's basements, and then it just keeps going until you've got eight feet of water it's up to the rafters in at least 10 homes on this block here. In the 2018 storm, about 60 homes in this neighborhood had major water damage. Many qualified for the buyout, but that would leave a lot of empty space. City engineers came up with a different plan. Bury concrete boxes that will take up the entirety of the street underneath the street and bury them underground so that the, that flash of water that's waiting for the storm sewer to catch up in capacity has a place to wait other than people's basements. It'll take about a year to complete and it will be invasive for the people who live here, but Gano hopes it will do the trick to keep water out of these homes. A site where you can see construction right now is here at 38th and Amick. This is what it looked like after the flooding. Water came through a ravine, crossed the road, smashing the embankment and caving it into the creek bed below. Neighbors were largely lucky, not much property loss here. And Gano says the damage was obvious and easy to see, which means this site didn't need a redesign, just a simple repair. The pipes that are carrying the regular every day, uh, every other week rainstorm are still the same ones and they're still doing, uh, still doing their job. What we want to do is put this back and make it safe. Uh, and restore its capacity to do, to do the, the function that it was built to serve. However, a stone's throw away on Urbandale and 35th, a completely different challenge. Two houses once stood on this now empty lot with a storm drain pipe in the back of the property. Flood water overwhelmed that pipe and flowed right through the homes. In an instance where more construction didn't make sense, the city took a simpler approach to give flood water space here. They bought and tore down those two homes that stood right here. This approach is sometimes the cheapest way to solve the problem uh, where for a, a couple hundred thousand dollars we can erase the homes uh, and get them out of the way of future floodwaters whereas building a bigger pipe from there to all the way across the street uh, could easily be one million, two million, three million dollars. And nowhere were buyouts more widespread than here along Four Mile Creek. This area has been vulnerable for decades. Homes flooded, water rescues in the raging creek. These tree lined streets are in the 100 and 500 year floodplains. And a year ago, they were also lined by houses, 100 of which were so badly damaged they were eligible for the buyout. 80 families accepted, and the city went in to clear all that space. So we can take this land and turn it back to floodplain and just let the creek do what it's going to do. Uh, this kind of low density single family neighborhood is very hard to justify the investment uh, with, with, uh, to the federal government for levees or other major flood control structures. Uh, so oftentimes the best way to protect a neighborhood is to, is to pull the boundaries of the neighborhood back to where we know it's safe and uh, that, that everyone can live with a reasonable amount of security and resiliency. There are some holdouts, but for the most part, it's quiet here after the storm, and Gano knows this isn't the last of the work to be done, nor is it the final test from Mother Nature. What we've seen over the last several years is an increasing intensity uh, of rainfall, more frequent and more intense than in earlier decades or in the last century. So we are expecting things to get worse before they'll get better. With that in mind, Gano says there are things that each individual property owner can do to help manage any flood water. And the city does have a program that will help defray the cost of improvements like rain barrels, rain gardens, landscaping, and even improving the soil so it can absorb more water. Doesn't sound like a lot when a lot, but when a lot of houses add up to do it, it does help quite a bit. You can find out more about that on the City of Des Moines website. Now, something else that will also add up is that penny increase on sales tax that will go into effect on July 1st. Here's what the city manager of Des Moines says they'll be able to do with the extra millions that will generate. It's an investment in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our streets, and in our libraries. And because of that, those are multi-year projects. 
and we need to continue those projects through, uh, through several years. Back here at Four Mile Creek, the pain from living through a near-death experience and having to rebuild, start over from scratch, is recurring for many, especially anytime it rains. We are Iowa.com's Jacob Pecklow is with a woman at her home who says she is still living in that storm. I didn't think much of it inside until I really walked in there. I couldn't believe, I mean, there's no words to express. It was a shock. Since last summer's flooding, Yolanda Rubio, they had to jack up the house actually to even it all out right there in the middle. And her family have invested hundreds of hours into rebuilding. Just the skeleton of a house inside. The space from top to bottom looks vastly different, but their anxiety still very fresh. Every time it rains, we, we're scared that same thing that happened last year might happen to us again. Just last month, their yard was a mini lake again. And all of that gets wet all the time. And we're not talking just a little bit wet. We're talking all you see is water. And throughout last summer and the fall, it was difficult for her family to get the attention of local leaders to come and help them. Nobody ever came out here. I know I spoke to one of the, what is it, the councilman that is here in our district. and. He never heard of such a street. Thanks to the strength of volunteers who spent those hot summer days working, their home now looks radically different. Everything right here, the walls got torn down here and right here. This arch is new, this island bar is new. Where would you be right now, Yolanda, if you didn't have those people? Probably the house would be a foreclosure. I'd probably just give it up and probably struggling to get somewhere else. To make sure these changes last and they preserve all that they have, the Rubios have adjusted their emergency plans. There was just the bars. As a family, they will never forget how they got here or the grind to find their footing again. We're always gonna have it in the back of our head. This is what happened in 18, but we need to get it out of our head so we can move forward and see what better things we can do in the future. Not only were many homes flooded, many businesses had to close for weeks or even months, including the Harding Hills High V, who used the disaster to do more with their old space. The current is ridiculous. Oh my God. I was actually at home that night and uh, we were getting the same amount of rain, obviously, uh, where I lived. And uh, yeah, I was alerted and kind of kept abreast of what was going on throughout the night. And wasn't able to get here until a few hours later, obviously, with all the flooding that we had going on. Past our knees now. What the heck? You know, it was uh, totally unexpected. Uh, obviously, not something you ever prepare yourself for or, or your uh, people for. So, uh, it was uh, quite quite the shock walking in there for, for the first time. Are you, are you the last one? I think I'm the last person. I'm not sure. You know, it was it was pretty extensive damage throughout the store. Uh, you know, water's pretty destructive and just had to fight through it. We were closed for uh, about six months. To, uh, we were fortunate enough to have resources available to us to, to get in here and get the store cleaned up. And, you know, we've, we've been in this location since 1986 and I, we've been on not too far from here since the, since the late 60s and uh, it, it's, it's a very, very important to this community and, and we hear it all the time from our customers. And, and luckily we were able to get back together and help serve the community. We needed this change and God has given us this gift and I'm really proud and happy to have it. We had a, a satellite wine spirits down the strip mall that we were able to move uh, in store. Uh, we were able to add a uh, Mia Pizza department that uh, is a new concept to Hy-Vee. I can't even believe that a year, it's been a year already, but uh, yeah, it was it was a crazy year and it's hard to believe we've been open since November now and here we are hitting that one year anniversary since, since it happened, so it's moved very quickly. With danger looming, AJ Mum and Polk County's emergency management team had to act quickly to the rising water. But after a day of mowing his lawn, AJ Mum would not have another normal moment for weeks. We are Iowa.com's Jacob Pecklow returns now with his story. Our interaction with the National Weather Service started uh, that Thursday and Friday, and we certainly saw that there was a potential for a system to come through 
over that weekend. If you are not out, don't go out, please, because this is uh, becoming a very serious situation very quickly. Let's By late that Saturday night, Polk County's Emergency Management Director, A.J. Mum, knew this was no typical rain. And the, I think the potential was for three or four inches, which is a lot of rain, but uh, as we saw it, it ended up being closer to 10. Around 7.30, as the rains were intensifying, Mum and his team decided to bring extra people in to run the Emergency Operations Center. It took us some time to get here because, like everyone else, there, we didn't want to uh, drive through water over the roadways, so it took us about 45 minutes to, to get to the EOC, and uh, by that time we, we notified all of the cities that we'd be having a conference call. Also triggered in those initial hours, a code red, an automated emergency notification system. As they dealt with rising waters, evacuations, and imploding homes, they were also monitoring other water levels. So that was always in the back of our minds, and then we get the seven inch rain right on top of us. If there is a silver lining in that, is that that, that seven to 10 inch rain largely fell, you know, at Sailorville or below. Several spots were in imminent danger, and that meant quickly and accurately sharing information became critical. Obviously, Polk County is the, the largest uh, county in the state, uh, but on, on that day, we still needed help, and the great news was that we had a lot of friends and neighbors that, that pitched in and helped us. After pulling an all-nighter, and we, we definitely don't say that lightly, Mum held a press conference on Sunday morning with first responders and local leaders all in attendance to separate facts from fiction. It became the practice throughout the week to Polk sort County, through one of the most well furious the, floods uh, Central Iowa region. had seen in decades. Public information is always going to be a challenge. The, the information was changing so rapidly based on, on an event like this that it was difficult to keep pace with, uh, with the information and the, and the really hundreds of different sources of information. In the days to follow, Governor Reynolds toured the damage. Struggling homeowners sought out the county, desperately needing repairs or buyouts or even a combination of both. As they do with all disasters, Mum's team continued to assess what was working and what wasn't. Some of those things that we identified in the areas of strengths were the, the tremendous amount of cooperation, coordination amongst the cities, and you know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the real heroic work that took uh, took part uh, for the first responders that were out there. Mum says the county's hazard mitigation plan has been updated, engineers consulted, and other lessons implemented. He says of the tens of thousands of properties impacted, very few were in the actual floodplain. It comes with a great deal of cost, and uh, sometimes engineering to to a level of a 10-inch rain is just beyond the benefit cost analysis. And I know that's tough for, for, for people to really uh, digest and understand, but uh, that's the difficult job that, uh, that many of the people in engineering and, and our, as our communities develop, we need to, to factor those in. And, and the good news is, is that the communities here in the metro area are giving that a lot of thought. For those who've moved back home, he says taking a sober look at reality will better prepare them for next time as well. Some steps you can take now uh, on a nice day uh, to, to inventory your, your property to make sure you have adequate insurance coverage. I think that was you know, a huge um, you know, myth that people thought that, well, I don't live in a floodplain, so I don't need flood insurance or I can't get flood insurance. And those are just that, they're myths. Mum says the success of this rebuild will take a long time to fully realize. This is gonna be measured in years, not weeks and months. Um, but uh, you know, I think overall our community's learned a lot. We've, uh, we've, we've been prepared and we're gonna to continue to be more prepared tomorrow. Mom says one of the biggest types of losses people suffered that night was sentimental property, things like photo albums and family memories. His advice is to get out a scanner or go to the library to use one and turn the hard copies into digital files in case something like this happens again. Now, could this happen again? Chief Meteorologist Brad Edwards is in now with a look at what happened that night, plus the weather pattern. Well, there's no doubt that was a very heavy rainfall that we had last year, June 30th into July 1st here in the uh, metro. But it wasn't the heaviest rainfall event ever in Iowa. Uh, about 8 to 10 inches fell on the north side of the metro. Ankeny was one of those areas that got hit the hardest there. And that ended, of course, July 1st early in the morning. But you go back to 1998, there was a heavier rainfall event. In fact, this is the record rainfall, uh, the official record for Iowa. 13 inches Atlantic Iowa on June 4th. 
14th there, and that caused a lot of flooding out there in Cass County along the Nishnabotna River. So that was an epic flooding going on there. Now there is another record. It's not official, but 21 inches in Boyden, which was in 1926. That's in northwest Iowa. So yeah, these events do happen, and the way they happen is really you got to have everything come together here. The first thing you need is a saturated atmosphere, and that means you've got humidity at every level in the atmosphere. So we live down here at the surface, and we know it's hot and humid, and it was that day back last year. It was very hot and humid during the day, but it was also very humid up above where the clouds are at, and that helped to get those thunderstorms really juiced up and putting down a lot of rainfall. Next, you need a low-level jet stream and that's because at night these thunderstorm events a lot of times they happen at night because this low level jet gets going that's what happens at night this low level jet comes in from the south and it feeds the thunderstorms all night long sometimes because it has that warm moist air coming in from the south from the Gulf of Mexico basically so that's one ingredient as well and then something else that usually happens training of the storms that's when they follow the same path like basically like railroad car uh, train. It just follows that same path along a certain area and causes a lot of flooding. So do these events happen more now than ever? Well, some would say yes. I think statistically we are seeing more of these events and some are attributing that to our climate change and global warming. You can always be ahead of the storm with the most accurate forecast on the We Are Iowa app. You can sign up for targeted alerts, including severe weather pinpointed by your zip code. Interactive radar you control along with hour by hour forecasts anywhere you need to know what's coming your way. Search We Are Iowa for either Android or iPhone. To watch these stories and all of our flood 2018 coverage, check out this special section of WeAreIowa.com. And on behalf of everyone at WeAreIowa.com, I'm Stephanie Engelson. Be safe.